Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Pastor Rodney Brailsford, the pastor of Berwyn United Methodist Church, and it's a joy to worship with you on this day. Today, congregations around the globe celebrate World Communion Sunday. Most of us have heard about World Communion Sunday, but may not know much about where the celebration originated. World Communion Sunday began in 1936 in the Presbyterian Church and was adopted by the Federal Council of Churches in 1940. Since then, the celebration has grown into an international, ecumenical celebration of Christian unity. The key word for World Communion Sunday is communion, or unity. It's a day when we mark the almost universal Christian practice of breaking bread with one another and remembering both the night of Jesus' betrayal, when Jesus instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper as a lasting remembrance, and of Jesus' sacrifice. So accounts of the Last Supper feature prominently by virtue of World Communion Sunday being a celebration of the Eucharist. But there is a flavor of the Christian celebration of Pentecost as well, when people from around the Mediterranean world came together in mutual understanding and inspiration by the power of the Holy Spirit. World Communion Sunday is a time for remembering that around the globe in different languages with different traditions and customs and in various forms of liturgy, the Lord's Supper is celebrated throughout Christendom. At its best, therefore, World Communion Sunday serves two purposes. It is both a joyous and meaningful partaking in Jesus' sacred meal with his friends and a mind-opening exposure to different Christian traditions from around the world. Friends, I now want to share with you a video which explains how your giving during World Communion Sunday brings God's grace, compassion, love, and healing to a world that needs Christ so desperately. When was the last time you shared a meal with someone on the other side of the world? Jesus prayed that we would be one, yet when we look at the world today, too often we see his followers divided while the world's most pressing needs go unaddressed. If we focus on the forces that pull us apart, it's easy to feel discouraged, overwhelmed, and anything but united. But on World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October, we celebrate what binds us together, the love of Christ that empowers us to make this world a better place as one people committed to one purpose. This rich ecumenical tradition of World Communion Sunday that began about 80 years ago celebrates the diversity of believers of all ethnic backgrounds. Through your generous gift on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church, we do more together to promote unity by empowering education. Your support provides scholarships and in-service training programs for U.S. racial and ethnic students and international students on both undergraduate and graduate levels, giving them tools they need to transform the world. Together, we equip students from around the globe to shape a unified future in so many ways by helping the least of these know the mercy and love of Jesus. As believers unite on World Communion Sunday, our bread may be different, but we share our love for the bread of life. As we share the fruit of the vine, our commitment to follow the example of Jesus unites us. Together, as engaged disciples, we give on World Communion Sunday to promote unity and empower passionate students to tear down the walls that divide us and lead us to do more through our shared communion in Christ. Together, we do more.
Friends, our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. In this familiar passage, the apostles ask Jesus to increase their faith. May you be blessed in the hearing of God's word. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was supposed to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all creation, maker of the world and everything in it, you are never far from each one of us. We come into your house seeking you, O giver of life and breath. Reveal yourself to us, dwell with us and abide in us. We live because you live. We hope because of you. In the name of Jesus Christ in whom we live and the spirit of truth who abides in us. Amen. When I was in seminary, I was required to take a course in New Testament Greek. I struggled to stay afloat in this class. In fact, I earned an F on my first exam. I thought there's just no way I'm passing this class. It's too hard. I remember sitting in my office at home doing mental gymnastics before the first exam. I was going to figure out this New Testament Greek. I thought, scripture tells me that I can do all things. And I took the test and I received an F. Well, one day my parents came to visit me. What are you doing, son, my dad asked. Studying for New Testament Greek, I said. This class is so hard, I got an F on the first exam. My dad responds, that's because you're looking at the page too intensely. You need to relax. Look at the page in a relaxed manner. Rest in God's grace. Then you'll absorb all you need to know. Then he went on to say, I know you're in seminary and that's supposed to be academic and that's good. I don't undermine that, but don't forget that your calling is bigger than seminary. God wants you to trust him. He's got your back. You may feel like you're drowning in this work, but that's just anxiety kicking in. Rest in the Lord, Rodney. In fact, you have all the buoyancy you need. My dad loves the word buoyancy for some reason. In other words, Christ keeps us afloat. Not your own kicking, flailing our limbs and screaming. If you've ever observed someone learning to swim, you've observed that flailing and screaming does not help. Next, my dad told me to be persistent and faithful in what God had called me to be and do and to completely trust that God had already equipped me with all that I needed. In today's gospel, Jesus says, if you have faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. This saying of Jesus can be somewhat problematic, not because it's so bad or so hard, but because it makes people think of faith as a quantity, as something you can have more or less of. Usually people assume they have less faith and wish they could have more. If they had more, they could move mountains and sometimes there are mountains to be moved. In today's passage, the disciples beg Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. But he says to them, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. When I read this passage this time around, it almost sounded as if Jesus were saying, increase your faith. You don't need more faith. You only need the tiniest little speck. No, it's not about having more faith. It's about putting your faith in the right place, or more specifically, in the right person. In a book called The Heart of Christianity, the author claims that in Western Christianity, that is our kind of Christianity, faith has come to mean holding a certain set of beliefs or believing a set of statements to be true. For most people, being a Christian means believing that there is a God, believing that the Bible is the revelation of God, and believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for our sins. For some, the list would be longer, believing that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, believing in Genesis rather than evolution, believing that Jesus was born of a virgin, that 
He walked on water, that he raised the dead, that he himself was raised from the dead in a physical bodily form and that he will come again someday. Sometimes beliefs become very specific, believing in infant baptism instead of adult baptism or vice versa, believing in the rapture, believing or not believing in purgatory. The list goes on and on. But as you've probably experienced for yourself, believing the right things is very important to Christians. But here's the problem. All this emphasis on belief can quickly turn faith into a matter of the head rather than the heart. Back in the Middle Ages, the word orthodoxy meant right worship. In fact, that is the literal meaning of the word. But during the Protestant Reformation, it came to mean right belief. Partly because all those Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians were still figuring out what they believed. Should we baptize infants or should we baptize adults? Is communion a sacrament or an ordinance? And then there was this other thing, the Enlightenment, that changed the way we understood truth. In the Middle Ages, no one questioned the story of Jonah and the whale. It was in the Bible. Of course it was true. But during the Enlightenment, people began to ask, could there really be a fish big enough to swallow a man? And could a man really live after three days in its belly? The only truth that counted was that which could be verified scientifically. In other words, truth was replaced with fact. And so after the Reformation and the Enlightenment, faith has come to mean believing the right things and believing them no matter what, even if they're not scientifically verifiable. But it was not always so. The author of The Heart of Christianity says that in the Middle Ages, there were four different Latin words for faith, ascensus, fiducia, fidelitas, and visio. Ascensus, from which we get the word ascent, means giving one's mental assent to a claim or proposition that is believing that it is true. The opposite of this kind of faith is doubt or disbelief. For example, a man might go from doubting that a fish could swallow a man to disbelieving it altogether. Is this really what God wants from us? Our mental assent to a long list of theological propositions? Our heads rather than our hearts? You can believe all the right things and still be in bondage, still be miserable, still be unchanged. Faith as a sensus doesn't have much transformative power. Now that doesn't mean it's not important, but we can't stop there. The second Latin word for faith is fiducia, which means trust or radical trust. Fiducia is like floating in an ocean of God's grace. Fiducia is learning to trust the buoyancy of God. And the opposite of this kind of faith is not doubt, but anxiety or worry. In the middle of that storm on the Sea of Galilee, when they were afraid that their boat was going to sink, Jesus asked his disciples, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? A few chapters later, he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, will he not clothe you, O you of little faith? In both cases, he is talking about faith as fiducia, radical trust. The third Latin word is fidelitas, which can be translated as fidelity or faithfulness, specifically faithfulness in our relationship to God. It means what faithfulness does in a marriage, being faithful to God in the same way you might be faithful to a spouse. The opposite of this kind of faith is not doubt or disbelief, but unfaithfulness or adultery. Another biblical word for this kind of unfaithfulness is idolatry, giving one's ultimate loyalty and allegiance to something other than God. This kind of faith means being loyal to our Lord God and not to the seductive would-be lords of our lives, whether the nation or affluence or achievement or family or desire. The fourth Latin word for faith is visio. Visio is a way of seeing the whole, a way of seeing what is. And there are three ways of seeing it. One is to see reality as essentially hostile, as if everyone and everything were out to get you. It may not surprise you to learn that there have been some forms of popular Christianity through the centuries that have viewed reality this way, as if God himself were out to get us, and that unless we offered the right sacrifices or said the right prayers or did the right things, he would. The second way of looking at reality is essentially indifferent. Someone with this view might say the universe is made up of swirling force fields of matter and energy, but is neither hostile to nor supportive of our lives and dreams. And if God is the one who brought it all into being, he has long since stopped intervening or even caring about it. If you look at reality this way, you may not be as defensive as in the other view, but you might become rather selfish, looking out for only yourself and those you love, since obviously no one else cares. 
The third way of looking at reality is essentially nourishing and life-giving. It has brought us and everything else into existence. It is filled with wonder and beauty. It loves us and cares about us. This is the reality Jesus was talking about when he said, look at the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. God feeds them, God clothes them. God sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. Can you see what a difference faith as visio could make in your life? What a difference there would be in seeing reality as essentially hostile, essentially indifferent, or essentially nourishing and life-giving. This last way of looking at reality can lead to the radical trust we talked about earlier. Or to use words from Paul, it leads to a life marked by freedom, joy, peace, and love. Well, there they are, four Latin words for faith, ascensus, fiducia, fidelitas, and visio. And you may have noticed that all but the first one are relational. Fiducia describes a relationship of radical trust. Fidelitas describes a relationship of love and loyalty. Visio describes a relationship of life-giving nurture. Ascensus is the only one that means giving our intellectual assent to a set of theological propositions, and as I said, that's important, but it may not be the most important thing. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus says, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And so we try to increase our faith. We try to believe more and doubt less. We try to believe things that are, frankly, unbelievable. And we do it because there are mountains that need to be moved in our lives. But what if that's not what Jesus meant? What if he meant, you don't need more faith. You only need the tiniest little speck. No, it's not about having more faith. It's about putting your faith in the right place, or more specifically, in the right person. Because here's the truth. That little mustard seed is found only five times in the Gospels. It's mentioned twice in reference to faith, in this sense, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed. But the other three times Jesus uses it, he says if the seed is planted in the ground, this tiny seed can become a huge bush, even a tree in which the birds of the air can build their nests. A mustard seed, in other words, is something small that can grow big if you put it in the ground, that is in the right place. But if you throw it in a box somewhere or in the garage or in the attic, the mustard seed will always stay the same. What if Jesus is trying to tell us this, that we don't need a lot of faith, we only need the tiniest little speck of faith, but we need to put our faith in the right place? Not in ourselves, like I did in my New Testament Greek class, or our ability to believe and achieve, but in God, the one who gives us life and nurtures it, the one who loves us like a faithful spouse, the one we can trust completely, and yes, the one who can and does move mountains. Let us put our mustard seed of faith in a gracious, loving, empowering, and nurturing God, and watch that seed grow. Earlier I quoted a scripture from Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, but what I left out was Christ. The scripture says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The reason I struggled through New Testament Greek was that I left out Christ. I attempted to complete the course through ascensus, my own mental ascent to rules, but when I rested in the knowledge that God had equipped me and was with me on the tumultuous sea of life, everything changed. I earned an F on my first test, but on every test to follow, I earned an A. In fact, I received an A in the class. Ultimately, my dad was telling me to just relax. Rest in God's grace and God's provision. Just as Jesus tells his disciples to relax during that storm on the Sea of Galilee, when they were afraid that their boat was going to sink or capsize. Jesus asked his disciples, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? That is, where have you placed your faith? Where have you placed that seed? In the ground or in the attic? In God or in yourself? What I ignored was the rest of the verse, through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's as if I can hear the God of this universe saying to you that he has always been with you, that God abides with you even now and will continue to be with you. Let go and let me do the work on you, for you and through you, period. O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Let us pray. 
faithful God of this earth, it is easy for us to comfortably imagine so many other Christians praying today and receiving the elements of Holy Communion. We like to think of this as a nice event. Yet you remind us that when we have received these gifts, we are also called to use the strength that they provide to witness to others through acts of reconciling love. This communion is not a nice service meant for our comfort. It is a challenge for us to truly accept the love of Jesus Christ, who gave to us his body and his blood, that we might be redeemed to do God's loving will. As we have gathered here this day, bringing our prayer concerns to you, Lord, help us to remember that you hold each one of us gently and lovingly, offering your healing mercies. Give us courage to be your witnesses, seeking peace in this war-torn world. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, who is the living Christ. Amen. Friends, please enjoy special music by Alex Boyer in BYU Men's Chorus and Philharmonic. This is Baba Yetu, which is the Lord's Prayer in Swahili.
In the silence of the morning, as the new day dawned around the world, God's people began to gather for worship amid the sounds of drums or pipes, strings or organs. And now we too join in this worldwide chorus of those who call upon the name of the Lord. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember especially that the scriptures are fulfilled as people will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. So come, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you are strong, but because you seek God's strength. All those who trust in Jesus are invited to come and join in the feast that God has prepared. Among friends gathered around the table, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Later, after they had eaten, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is God's new relationship made possible by my life and death. Whenever you drink it, do it remembering me. So now, following Jesus' example, we take this bread and wine, for in them he has promised to be with us, making us whole, making us one, and in celebration of God's goodness, let us give thanks. Let us pray. O living God, for your blessing and creation, for your image deep within us, for your life in all its fullness, we give thanks. O Jesus, our brother, for your coming to earth, calling us your friends, for your sharing of life and death, we give you thanks. O spirit of grace and truth, for revealing yourself in community, healing us in our brokenness and inspiring us with courage to share who we truly are, we give you thanks. O Trinity of love, for the promise of a spreading tree giving shade and protection, for the vision of a body in which each part works for the health of the whole, for the invitation to a feast where the despised will be guests of honor, we give you thanks. God of justice and peace, you stand with those who are poor, now in prayer, spoken and unspoken, we call upon you, silently naming in our hearts those who suffer the injustice of violence and want. We call upon you silently, naming in our hearts those who carry heavy burdens. We silently name in our hearts those whom we love and those who love us. Where shall we go from your spirit and how could we be away from your presence? If darkness covers us and night closes in on us, you are there. For the night is not dark, for you are the light of the world. Spirit of the living God, be present with us now. Breathe into us and onto us the spirit of the gifts of bread and wine, that sharing in your blessing and your broken life, we may share in your continual presence and reality. Loving and sacrificial God, may your grace be extended to all whom we have named, and together as your body, we ask that you empower us and strengthen us to abide in your love. It is in the name of your Son, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Friend, this is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us take part in this holy sacrament. Friends, now we pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God has poured God's love unto you, go now in peace to bring God's love to the world. God is the God of creation, the entire planet. Rest in the confidence of God's abiding presence with you and be joyful in your service to God. Rest in the knowledge that all that is ultimately needed in your service to God is God's grace. Go now to feed the world. Bring hope in place of despair. Remember the poor. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>